Hi, welcome to Learn and Flutter. And this is part three of our mini series on understanding the block pattern. Now the way we've been doing it is we've been sort of looking at the elemental parts of what would be going into implementing the block pattern. So we haven't really implemented it yet. We're just looking at all the stuff. So we looked at futures, we look at streams, and today we're gonna to be looking at state machines. And then I promise you in the next video, we'll actually implement the black pattern. And it's my hope that by going through it this way with you and then connecting the dots, that the block pattern is not gonna be a mystery for you when you go to use it. So let's jump in. So here's what I wanna start with. Like I said, we're gonna be looking at a state machine. So I figured, why not? Let's all get on the same page, at least what we think a state machine is. So if you've never seen a state machine or you haven't used one in a long time, don't worry. I'll break it down and make it super simple and straightforward that you should get it. So let's say that you want to write a piece of software that remembers sort of different ways in which it can be changed over time. So an example might be that if you think about how you drive a car, before you can move the car, you have to put a key in the injection, you have to start the car. And even while the car is started and running, it's still not able to move yet. You still have to put it in gear. And before you put it in gear, well, you have to mash the pedal to be able to engage, um, you know, putting it in gear. And then which gear do you put it in? And when it's in a certain gear, it sort of remains in that gear until certain conditions causes it to change gear. Now, if you're an automatic transition, the faster you go, the more you give it gas, well, it goes through from low gear to high gear. And then eventually you might have to come to a stop. So if we look at the different stages of where that car can be, we can say that oh, it's in different state. It can be the state in which it's stopped, in the state in which it's moving, in the state in which it's accelerating, in the state in which it's parked, in which it's state the engine is off, in the state when the engine is running. So you could think of those as different states. Now, how do we go from one state to another? Some action had to take place. When it, whether it was us turning the key to in order to move it from the not running state to the started state, or whether it's mashing the gas pedal or the brake or something to change one of the other states so it can move or be engaged. So those are events that cause the state or action that cause the state to change. So in our example, we're going to imagine some weird system. It does, we don't know what it is. It's just some abstract system that has some state or some defined places that it can be in. And in order to move from one state to another, we need an external action. Or in our case, we can call it an event. So this green dot now re represents the initial state of our, our machine or our software or whatever you want to call it. And so we can say upon creation, our thing moved from the init state to like the started state. Now, the way you get it to move from that initial state to the started state is by giving it the event or sending the event start. And once the state machine sees this event start, it knows that it has to transfer or move from the initial state to the started state, which is the oval. Now, we can also move from the started state to the stop state. We can also move from the stop state to some final state. And this would be by maybe sending an event or presenting an event end to say, well, you know what? I'm going to shut everything down. And once we reach the end state, we can no longer go back into any state. The, the end state represents the final situation in which we terminate everything. So you could imagine this as a program exiting or something like that. Um, so therefore, if you ever want to rerun that application, you have to start it over again. But that terminal state is a state that you cannot return from. Now, this is a very simple state machine. It just has essentially four states, but the initial state and the end state, we really can't Think of them as states, even though they're sort of states, because when the system came into being, it started that initial state on the farthest left side. And then when everything is ended, it, it went into the final state. But the two states in between, we can transition back and forth between those states or even from those states to other states. 
So for example, if you imagine that we're in the started state, we might introduce a running state. So something might be started, but it's actually not moving or something like that. And we can say that we can move to the running state and we can give it the event go to transition it out of the static state into the running state. So what these arrows that leave a state really tell you is what are the allowed or valid transition that can occur to another state. So from our started state, we can either go to the stop state if we get the stop event while in the started state, or we can go to the running state if we get the go event while we're in that static state. And let's say we're in a running state. If we get a pause event, we can go to a state called pausing. Maybe we need to take some time to notify the rest of the system that we need to you know, go to pause. And so we can be in this pausing state where we try to pause. And if that's successful, then we can move into where we are actually paused. But what if trying to pause, maybe an error occur? And so that might be an if error situation in which we say, if you're trying to pause, uh, you can just transition to the end state. And notice, we didn't have to get an event to go from pausing to end. If while in the pausing state, we encounter some error exception, we might just transition to that end state because we don't really know what to do or how to recover from a failed pause. And again, if we're in the pausing state, it might be a temporary state and we just automatically, once we finish pausing, we transition to pause. Again, no other external event was required to go from pausing to pause. And while we're paused, we can go back to something like a running state again, by if we in the pause state and we get a message, it can say, hey, if you're in a pause state and we get the event go, we can go back to like the running state. And of course we can sort of repeat this where we're running, we can pause again and those, that, that loop can, occur multiple times. Also, we can do things like if we're paused, we're allowed to transition to the stop state. And we know from before that once we're in the stop state, we can also transition to like the end state. Um, but we can say that, oh, you know what, if you're stopped, we can probably go back to visiting the start state by again sending it um, a start event while we're in the stop state. And you can see already, we only have a few states. Those are only five states, but based on the lines alone, look how many lines we have going back and forth all over the place. So a state machine can be very complex, get very complex very easily. Now, because we have this state that you can go to and not return the end state, we have created what's called a finite state machine because it can terminate, but not all state machines are finite. And it doesn't mean you have to have one end state. There are other ways you can end in different way. You can end on error. You can, you know, so just keep in mind that oh, there's a very simplified state machine. But hopefully this gets us all on the same page about what a state machine is. The key takeaway here is that we have state that where you can be in, and this can represent um, a place that you arrive as a result of a certain input or event. Now, one of the things I didn't show here is that you can have data associated with event. So for example, when we do the go, like if you're in a started state and you say go, we can parameterize that with some value that says, how fast should we really go, right? And if we're doing pause, like how long should we wait before we can pause? And if it's taking too long, maybe that's what allows us to consider this an error. Let's imagine that's how there's a state machine. Most of the time, you are not going to see the details of the state machine unless you have to implement it or update it or something like that, or you're designing it. Most of the time, you're going to interact with a state machine, and the state machine is going to be a black box. And what it means is that it's going to be hidden behind a set of interfaces that allows you to just simply interact with it as input and output. So you can imagine sending those same event in to this black box and the state changes, the machinery changes inside, and then all you're allowed to do is get the output, which is what are the actions that was performed or to be performed, or what the current state is so that you can take that action. That depends on how this is implemented, but just sort of keep it in mind that most, for the most part, your state machine is going to be a black box. And so what we'll see in the next video is that we're going to turn 
our state machine into the block. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to have events and things coming in and then out coming out of that black box are going to be the updates or the result, the current state. But this is a little bit just peek ahead to show you that we're going to turn a state machine basically into the block pattern. But anyway, let's now go look at some code. And the only reason why I'm going through some code of trying to implement a state machine is because the state machine and the block pattern, like I said, or the block is going to look so similar that I figured out oh, that's one of the dots we should sort of cover. And then when we connect it with streams, we'll see the whole picture. Here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor. Well, not quite, I'm at my command line and this is my directory and I'm opening the directory part three and I can run this command again and you can see just bring my Visual Studio Code editor to the front and you can see that the directory is empty. So let's start by creating a directory. For, let's call it for exercise one. And I want to say this before I start getting into the code. This code is already on GitHub. So don't freak out if you see me typing fast. You can literally stop the video, go look at the code, and you'll see the end result of what I'm going to type. So you really can sort of travel to the future in this case. There's no point in seeing me make mistakes and back up and correct and all that sort of stuff. All you're interested in is what the end result of the code look like. Can you get your hands on it? And can you test it? All right, so let's get started. So let me create a main.dart file. And like we said, the key takeaway for the state machine is that we have events and states. So let's start by thinking about the events that we had. So we said we had start, go, pause, stop, and end as events. These are the things, the triggers that cause the transition from one state to the other. So how can we represent it in code? So Dart has enums. It's like a way of creating constants. So let's create um, an enum called event. All right, there we go. That's our, e our enum that represents all the valid events that we can possibly send or use with our state machine. The other thing we said is that we have states, which represent the places that where the system can get to as a result of these events, our transition from as a result of these events. So again, let's create another enum in this case to represent our states. So those are the states, but let's put some comments to remind us of what we had going on in our diagram. So now that we have defined our set of events, our load events, and our state, and we've made some notes here on which events transition out of this particular state. So for example, if we're in the state in it, the start events transition us out of that state to the started state. So let's now try and implement a simple state machine. But before I do that, let's just um, get our main going and then imagine how we might want this to work. So imagine that we had a class called state machine. We can get a new instance of that state machine. We might want to be able to inquire about what the current state of that state machine is. So we want a method called get state. So let's write that. And what would we say? We said that when you create a state machine, it's in this init state. So we should put a constructor on our class. So when we create any state machi machine object, it's in the correct state, this init state, the start, not the started state, but that initial state. And we've ensured that oh, it's in the correct state. So let's run this and see if that's what we get. All right. So we have our state machine is in the start state. So let's close this window now. And we haven't implemented any transition. So let's implement now some transition from, let's say, for example, when we're given the event start that we transition to the started state. All right, so I don't see any error. I don't know why this is complaining. So let's run it and see. Oh, okay. Oh, we need a break. Yep. There we go. All right. Good. I'm glad it caught that because that's not wasn't my intention to do a fall through. So, um, so yeah, if we run our code again, we should still be in the init state. We haven't done anything to transition out of that state. 
let's know that we have a state machine. Let's do on and then give it an event. Let's do the event um, start, for example. And we can print out um, what it should be. We should be in the started state. And then if we, again, send it another event, like event that go, for example, this should put us in the running state. And what about if we send it while we're in the running state, let's send it uh, an event that it's not allowed um, to happen or we haven't implemented. So for example, we'll say event that stop, for example, and we should still be, the expectation is that here we should see we are in the started state, then we are in the running state, and we should still be in the running state. And so we can see that we transition from start in its state to the started state, and now we're in started state. We are about to run, so we transition from the started to the running state, and we're in the running state. And then when we sent it the stop event, we get that oh, it's on an handle event, and we're still in the running state. Well, maybe we should do when we have an on handle event, we should probably just return without printing out anything else. So that way it's not confusing. And so there you go, right? We have an on handle event, and our state is still running state. Okay, so that's good. So there's a problem with our code, and that is, while we're doing state transition, we're not checking to verify that the state that we are in allow for the transition. So for example, when we get the start event, we assume that oh, we're in the init state, but we haven't confirmed that we're in the init state. What if we got the start event again while we're in the running state, which our code does not prevent? This would be an error. So for example, instead of doing stop, what if we did start again? while we're running, we know that oh, this is not a low transition. We're not allowed to go from running and accept the start event, but there's nothing in our code to prevent this. And so if we run the code again, let's clean up, clear the screen, run. You can see we started, we are running, and then we started again. This is not correct. So let's fix this. So let's call what we just did. I just reorganized the code a bit. What we just did, exercise two. So the next thing is exercise three or example three. And that's where we're going to put some validation for our state's transition. So where we're going to do that is by doing this. If we use a map, basically, if we can look up the state that we're in to see what are the valid transitions. So here we, we have essentially that mapping. If we use a map, we can say our current state is in it, and the only allowed transition um, or event that we are allowed is to get um, this start state. So we just need a state to event lookup. Okay, so there we are. We have mapped all of our states to their events. And so what this means now is that when we enter this function, the first thing we can do is check if this event is allowed in this state. Basically, what we're saying is look up the current state in the map to find all, to find the list of events, then see if the list of events that are for this state, if it, it contains the event that we're given. If that is true, then great, proceed. But if it's not, then we know that oh, that's not a valid event for this state. So if we keep the code that we had before in which we tried to send a start event while we are in the running state, we should see an error message that says um, event that, or that is not valid for this state. And so now let's expand this, clear this out, and rerun. And you can see, now we get the error message and we don't change state. One of the things that you can do is if you look at how we're calling our state machine is that we say state machine that on and so on. And we keep calling this. So for some people, this might seem a little bit tedious to keep doing it this way. But remember in Dart, we have this shortcut where we can say something like this. And what this means, we're using the same object and calling it three times. This is just syntactic sugar for exactly what we had before. So this is one way of doing it. 
Another way to do things is to use what's called a fluid design. And so what you can do is say that oh, my on method returns a state machine. Return this, which is an instance of the state machine. So now with this, so this is one way of calling it. Um, my editor reformatted this way, which is pretty ugly. But the advantage of that is that you can do something like this now. This method does not require you to do anything fancy. You still have a void function, um, but just syntactic sugar from Dart. Whereas this method is called fluid API, where you can chain things together. So we can say this, that, this, that, 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 that. And then we can even call the that get a state machine object, get a da, da, da. And then at the end, we call um, the get state. Frankly, I like clear and simple code to read. So I do not like either one of these two. I prefer to see each line by itself, but I just wanted to show you that that's another option. So I am not going to implement all the states of this state machine or all transitions because that's not the purpose. I wanted to give you a little idea of where we're heading and show you how if you can understand this much of the state machine that we can get an event and we can change the internals or change what is being represented. Um, that is what you need to implement a block pattern. And in the very next video, I will take the same code and turn it into a block. And this is all you really need to do. We don't, if you want you, for practice, you can go ahead and try to implement the full state machine. You have everything you need here. So, all right, that's it. Um, thanks for your time and patience and see you in the next video. Bye.